Damas y caballeros, la lectura comenzará en un minuto. Por favor, tomar sus asientos. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our third lecture for this morning is Dr. Michael O. Sloboskikov, a teacher from Troy University. Dr. Sloboskikov is an expert in Russian, the former Soviet Union, international cooperation networks, international law, security, and international conflict. He holds the PhD in political science from the University of Arizona. Dr. Zuboskuki Kikov has published several peer review articles. His books are Strategic Cooperation, Overcoming the Barrier of Global Anarchy, Building Hegemonic Order, Russia's Ways, Rules, Stability, and Predictability in the Post Soviet Space, and the most recently, Cultural Imperialism in the Decline of the Liberal Order. Russian and Western soft power in Eastern Europe, co-author with Dr. Doug Davis. An associate professor in political science, he chairs the political science department at Troy University. He specializes in relationships between Russia and the former Soviet, Union, former Soviet states, international conflict and peace, security, and comparative politics. He is a regular contributor to Russia's direct and has often served as an analyst on Russian relations with Ukraine for the BBC World News, as well as the Voice of Russia. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Edelvoskikov. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Thank you, Colonel, for, for inviting us. This is a wonderful event and one that we're very happy to be a part of. Uh, and so today we've heard several good presentations. I hope not to scare you as much as the previous uh, presentation. So I'll go a little bit lighter. Uh, so um, this year is a big anniversary, as many of you know. It's it's the in uh, uh, in November of 1989 we saw the fall of the Berlin Wall. So this is the 30th anniversary. At that time, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was this general euphoria about the triumph of liberalism. Uh, the colonel and I were having this discussion. It was, it was the triumph of one idea over another. Communism had failed. The end of the Cold War. The world looked fantastic. And here we are just 30 years later, and the world is a very different place. We're seeing a resurgent Russia, we're seeing China start to, to, to challenge the world order, and it's really an attack on the global liberal order. So I want to talk a little bit today about where Russia's coming from, why, what it's doing, what it's doing in, in Eastern Europe, and what's motivating us, or what's motivating it, and what we can do to try and mitigate these problems, these threats. Next slide. So the plan of the talk, I want to give a very brief history of Russia. If I gave a, a true history of Russia, we'd be here all day. Okay, I want to give a very brief history. I'll give you a couple of overall themes, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of more modern events to, to talk about. We'll move into the current situation in Russia. We'll talk about, the, about Eastern Europe, what motivates the Eastern European states. During the Cold War, we, we generally put together Eastern Europe and Russia, we no longer do that anymore. They're distinct. They're worried about Russia more so than we are. Okay? And then I'll talk about the sources of tension uh, between Russia and the, and the West, and then I'll try and talk about whether or not Russia is a menacing or a hibernating bear. We'll go back to that, that former view of Russia as, as a bear. Next slide, please. 
Okay. What is Russia? Yes, we can go on to the next slide. I'm sorry. A large country. Okay. Over 12 time zones. Okay. Much larger than we are. But in terms of population, we hinted at this earlier, the demographic situation is bad. At the fall of the Soviet Union, the, the people were just not having children. Right? This is terrible. You can't build a very advanced country if you can't replace your population. You've got an aging population. You've got a declining, uh, you've got declining age of living, right? Declining standards. It used to be that universities were very selective and hard to get into. Now they're trying to beg people to attend, okay? You've got certain mayors in the Far East who have special holidays designed to make children. They're paid federal or paid regional holidays, okay? Some, some mayors have even given away cars and, and other groups to the first child born in the new year, okay? These are all problems of demography, okay? These are all problems of demography. Next slide. This is the common view we see of, of Russian power, although this is St. Basil's Cathedral here, but the power is inside the Kremlin off to the left. Okay, usually consolidated in the hands of one person or, or the people around that person. Often it's not a very transparent form of process, okay? Um, but generally those who have relaxed their control on, on, uh, their, uh, on rule have often found that they will either face coup from those on the right who want more or they want more reforms from those on the left. And that was what happened to, for example, Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union. Okay, he, he had to walk a fine line. Next slide, please. Okay. I choose the Russian winter for my pictures very carefully. Okay, because it's very cold, right? It's very cold. One of Russia's most strategic advantages is its winter, okay? Ask anyone who's invaded it, okay? Next slide, please, okay? Russia is a land of contrasts, right? It, as, as I spoke about last night with the commandant, it is a country with an unpredictable past, okay? Its past is constantly being reevaluated, redetermined. Okay, this is Ivan the Terrible who killed his son, okay, and then regretted it tremendously. So it illustrates the, the, the shifts of the, of the Russians. Next slide, please. Okay. Russia is a country that has been invaded many times from the Mongols to the French to the Germans, okay. And this really builds on the psyche. So there's a, there's a fear of attack, but yet there is also this competing ideology, which is an expanding empire, okay? Catherine the Great, Peter the Great, okay? Trying to expand the, uh, the empire, okay? Power without a nation's confidence is nothing. You need the support of the people, okay? She said, I shall be an autocrat, that's my trade. The good Lord will forgive me, that's his, okay? It is easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Okay, next slide. Napoleon, Napoleon invaded, okay? Napoleon's armies should have really beat the Russians, okay? Two things prevented him, one, winter, right? Okay, second thing, the Russians were willing to burn their own farms, their own population centers, so that Napoleon could not feed his armies. Okay? Next slide, please. The Russians are deeply religious. 
they believe very strongly in the fact that they suffer in this life so that they will be rewarded in the next. So they are willing to take a lot of punishment to get there. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. Now I move very uh, quickly on to, uh, to more modern history, right? Okay, so that, so that we know about the, uh, the threats that are posed today. Okay, the war in Chechnya really affected the Russian psyche greatly. You had terrorism within Russia, okay? And the Russians really felt that the West was not supportive in, in their wars in Chechnya. They felt that only after 9-11 did the West really understand what terrorism was within its own borders, okay? The Russians waged a brutal campaign in Chechnya, absolutely brutal. Okay, next slide. Okay. To show you just what type of a system the Russians have set up, okay, this is Kadyrov, okay, the leader that they put into the Chechens who was even more brutal than the Russians were, okay. This was to, to, to make sure that no one would even consider fighting against the Russians or the Russian power, okay? They were willing to level Grozny, okay, to achieve their ends, okay? Next slide, please, okay. Part of this was motivated by some of the terrorist attacks that took place in Russia. One of the most noted ones was the attack in Beslan uh, that was carried out uh, 334 civilians are killed, including 186 children. Okay? This is something that, that weighs heavily on the Russian psyche. So when, when the West would say, you're, you're conducting a brutal campaign in Grozny, the Russians would point to this and say, this is who we're dealing with. Okay? Don't complain. Okay, next slide. There is a revived nationalism, specifically because of President Putin, okay? President Putin came to power and he began to talk about the fact that Russia was disrespected, the fact that, that Yeltsin had cozied up too much to the West, that Russia was expected to deal with everything that the West said it should. Okay, he created more of an enemy, okay? He also created pride in one's country, right? Patriotism's good, nationalism when it goes overboard is bad, okay? Putin began to centralize power again into his people. Okay? and control everything. And they created what was called a social contract where they said, we're willing to take the rights of the people as long as we provide for their security and we provide for their well-being. There is an understood contract that they don't need particular liberal rights. Okay? And this was effective for a long time. Now there's Putin fatigue going on, but there's no one to challenge him. He's done a very good job at managing competition below him. He takes it out before their actual competition. Okay, so while, while, while the country isn't overly supportive of Putin, although we, we still see high support ratings, right? They're now in the 60s as opposed to the 80s. Many of our politicians would love 60% approval ratings, right? But part of that is because there is no actual competitor. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So one of the things that, uh, that we could look back about the Cold War was that there were really, it was a, a war of ideologies. There were two distinct ideologies. Well, what is Russia's ideology? I'm not sure we could point to one very easily. They've embraced capitalism, okay? They like to sell natural resources. They're one of the leading energy providers, 
Okay. But they don't have a, necessarily a distinct ideology, one that is, is separate from that of the U.S. Now, they do have a different view of the global order. Okay. And in 2007, at the Munich Conference for Security, President Putin got up and he berated the United States. And he said, your view of the world is that you tell everyone else what to do. And we're tired of that. We want to move towards multilateralism. We want a seat at the table. Okay. Now, what motivated that? President Obama in 2008 called Russia regional power, not one that should be worried about, right? We shouldn't worry about Russia. It's just a regional power. It's flexing its muscles where it can, but it doesn't concern us at the global stage. That's what motivates Putin. He wants a seat at the, at the table. He wants to be considered a major power. Okay? We can argue about whether they deserve the seat at the table. That's a different story, right? But that is what's motivating him. Next slide, please. Russia and the broader world. Russia is concerned with, with a few areas. China and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. China and Russia are traditionally rivals, but they have started to cooperate much more frequently and in more areas. That should be of grave concern to the United States moving forward. If they do begin to cooperate much more, they will challenge our, our global order more. Okay? They are concerned with the U.S. and the West. Okay? After the Ukrainian uh, invasion, the sanctions, they have hurt Russia. Right? Okay? And they are concerned with rogue states such as Iran, North Korea, Venezuela. Okay. Okay. Now notice with most of these, the, the, the rogue states, those are opportunities for making money. Those are opportunities for business. Okay. Russia opposed the, uh, the Europeans in the United States and Libya, partially because Libya was one of Russia's greatest trading partners. Okay. They didn't want to get rid of that. Okay. Syria, another example of a trading partner and access to a warm water port. Why was one of the reasons that Russia took Crimea? The warm water port, the Black Sea Fleet. We can discuss that more in a little bit. Next slide, please. 2008, this, this, was, this was really the first time the West said, oh my gosh, what happened? How did we lose Russia? Okay, what happened there? Okay. Saakashvili, who was the president of Georgia, can you still hear me? Okay, Saakashvili, who was the president of Georgia, um, had the understanding that if he went into the provinces of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, who had separated from Georgia in a civil war to get them back under control, that he would have full U.S. support in doing so. What he did not count on was the fact that there were Russian troops in South Ossetia who, when fired upon, were willing to, to go into Georgia to show him just what they thought of that idea. Okay? And so they invaded. Next slide, please. It was over with pretty quickly, but when you look at the actual reports, the Russian, the Russian military didn't fare as well as it really should have. It exposed a lot of problems with the Russian military. And so Putin saw those problems and really had to reevaluate his plans for maintaining a military and the strategic plan for their military. Next slide, please. Okay. Russian actions in Georgia, even though they're not in Eastern Europe, have frightened especially the Baltic states, 
tremendously. They frightened Poland, Hungary, all of the Eastern European states tremendously. Why? Because they could be next. Right? And they have to question, really, does NATO have their back? And will NATO go to war with them, with the Russians, over Poland? Okay? And judging by what's happening in Ukraine, they're not sure. Next slide, please. Okay. So Eastern Europe fears a resurgent Russia and a Russian invasion. Okay. Will the West aid Eastern Europe? I'm not sure. If we station U.S. troops in Eastern Europe, that's what they're pushing for now. Okay. Then there's a there's a better chance that that the West will aid Eastern Europe. Okay. But this is what motivated NATO expansion. Okay, this is what motivated NATO expansion in the late 1990s, 2000s. Next slide. Okay. Okay. But, again, Georgia taught Putin that there had to be a different way of invading. Okay. He could do it in a much quicker way. Little green men. Right? So in Crimea, we saw little green men who came in. It was unconventional warfare, and they very quickly took Crimea. Okay? They very quickly took Crimea. They had a referendum in Crimea. Crimea decides to join Russia. Okay? When everyone objected to that referendum saying, it's hard to hold a referendum when you've got an occupying force there. Okay, the Russians turned around and they played a game of whataboutism. This is one of their favorite games, right? Whenever they're challenged on something, they, they look to the US and they say, well, what about this, right? So they turn and they say, well, what about Kosovo? Okay. That's not a genuine answer, is it? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, but one of the real reasons that the Russians went into, into Ukraine, into Crimea especially, was because of the Black Sea Fleet. This was their national security interest. They have really worked on things such as uh, training dolphins and other marine mammals, okay? I don't know how many of you saw the news today about Norway and the beluga whale, okay? Um, this, is not, this is not new to the Russians. Okay, next, next slide, please. Okay. And then there was southeastern Ukraine. Okay, what happened there? And the Russians have begun, the, the Russians have clearly over time told U.S. policymakers, look, we don't want to lose Eastern Europe, right? We want our influence still in Eastern Europe. They lost Eastern Europe, okay? So they kept pushing it back, and they kept objecting to what the West was doing. They, they objected to NATO bombing of Yugoslavia, okay, but could do nothing to stop it, okay? They objected to the expansion of NATO, and finally, they said, look, here's our red line, okay? None of the former Soviet states, besides the Baltics, which are already parts of NATO, they cannot join NATO or the EU. We need our buffer states, okay? Remember back to how many times they've been invaded? They want those states mainly as buffer states. They don't want NATO right at their borders, okay? It's, it's not really that they, that they like uh, owning Ukraine or anything like that, but they do want those border states. They want their influence there, okay? Next slide, please. Okay, so the tension, I, I spoke a little bit about this between Russia and the West. The Russians have felt the tension from NATO expansion, uh, from the war in Yugoslavia. U.S. withdrawal from the ABM Treaty. Okay, and then finally, the diminished role of Russia as a great power. 
okay? They took nothing as a, as a greater insult than being called a middling regional power, okay? So they showed how middling they were by meddling in U.S. elections, right? Okay, so Russia has recognized its power capabilities and it has determined some of the best ways in which to function in an asymmetric society, okay? You do covert operations, you do, you do uh, non-traditional war, you use cyber war, uh, warfare, you use all, all sorts of other uh, actions which uh, lead to plausible deniability or plausible in quotes, right? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so is Russia a threat? Okay, there are those who are arguing, well, Russia has always been a threat and we just see this now, this resurgence, okay? But Russia is not as big a threat, I don't think, as we, as we think, okay? I think that Russia does not have the capabilities to be a severe threat the way we think they do. But going back to the previous talk, what scares me more is the fact that at least during the Cold War, we had sets of unwritten rules. We had procedures that we followed. None of those exist now. So, so the chance of accidental conflict leading to war is much greater now than I think it was during the time of the Cold War. That's what we should fear. I don't think either the, the West nor Russia really wants a war. What we should fear is the accidental war. Okay? okay. Those are some of the threats that Russia does pose, by the way. By the way, meddling in elections is nothing new to Russia. It does it all the time. It does it all over the world, right? This is nothing new, okay? I believe that's it. I tried to go as fast as possible. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, no, areas for cooperation. I want to end on a positive note, right? Okay, we've all been gloom and doom, okay? There are areas for cooperation. You know, the, the first person to call President Bush after 9-11 was Putin, okay? To offer assistance. Russia offered assistance that wouldn't have been even thought possible. In fact, many of the generals argued against it, okay? Allowing flyover capabilities, allowing the use of bases, okay? For the war in Afghanistan. Space is another area of cooperation, okay? And the final area where there could be cooperation is Another discussion, and I know words are, words are meaningless, but if you do talk, if you do begin to understand each other, your motivations, if you come together for a new Helsinki conference on European security, that can go a long way, okay? Will it fix anything? I don't know, okay? But those are, those are some areas that we, that, that low-hanging fruit for cooperation, how's that, okay? Any questions? Okay. Yes, Colonel. Uh, what do you see as Russia being the center microwave? The center microwave. Okay. So, so, okay. So, so thank you for that wonderful presentation uh, from all of us. Quick question. What do you think is Russia's end game? I mean, why the meddling of elections? Why all this? What do you think is the strategic end state of Russia? That, that Russia, instability works in Russia's favor, right? Um, 
Russia cannot win outright. So how how do you cause how do you cause uh, yourself to win? You cause instability in your foes, right? You use their own tools against them. You use Facebook against them, right? You use these bots. You start to sow discord in the in the public. You start to have fake news, to, to, to use that term, right? You start to, to, to begin to have these, sow these social discord and cause chaos within your opposition. That's the end game. And while we're focused on the, the, the problems within, we can't be focused on the problems with us. Sir, uh, Major Orozco, United States Army. Uh, the question that I have is, as you already mentioned, uh, has to do with Putin's revisionist policies that he's using and of revert uh, Russia back to Soviet age, right? In a way. Uh, so, what are his intentions, especially on the Western Hemisphere? We're seeing the Russians already working to modernize uh, the Cuban military. We're seeing them now in, in Venezuela. We see them in Nicaragua. So what, what is his end game, as already Colonel Alvaro mentioned, uh, within the Western Hemisphere, and what he's trying to do, his uh, uh, strategy? I, I, I think this goes to, 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 to the similar discussion on the end game, right? If you're focused on the Cuban military and what Russia's doing there, you can't focus on Russia somewhere else, right? And so, and so the more that Russia begins to focus through proxies and through other areas in the Western Hemisphere, the, the more it causes a fear of Russia, right? There is a fear of Russia right now. And B, it causes discord within the, the, the Western Hemisphere. And the U.S. has to spend expend resources in trying to combat this. And then if you can elaborate a little bit on, you mentioned something about the Russian military didn't fare too well in the invasion of Georgia. And what do you really mean when you say that? What do I really mean when I say that? What I, what I mean is, is that it was not, it, it, it showed problem in, in command and control, it showed problems in the, the units themselves, and it really spoke to the fact that there had to be a modernization of the, of the Russian military and the weaponry and, and things like that. So, so uh, Georgia was really a training ground for that. Uh, Eastern Ukraine has been used as a training ground for new weapons and training and, and new maneuvers and, and things like that as well. So, so uh, yeah. Does that answer your yeah. your question? Uh, just quick question uh, regarding uh, the buffer state and especially in the European theater. Uh, what would you consider like Finland or Ukraine an ideal model for Russia? And like, given that a lot of the EU countries are not part of NATO as well, so I think that if if Russia could could Finlandize Ukraine, they would think that a, a, a superb win. Russia doesn't want to own Ukraine. In fact, the public is already tired of what's going on in Ukraine. Okay, uh, but if if Russia can create a state that is neither Western nor is it fully Russian, um, then I think that, that Russia would consider that a win. Um, my question is, we've been putting a lot more soldiers and troops into Eastern Europe. How do you think that changes the security environment there? And are we presenting to the Russian Federation a greater threat by being there? Or is it something that they're able to balance? How much are we driving their securitization? The the former ambassador um, to Russia from the United States was Michael McFaul. And he kept lamenting over and over. He said, we keep telling the Russians that NATO expansion is not a threat to them. And so in fact, later I was, I was talking to uh, uh, Mearsheimer, Dr. Mearsheimer, about this very issue. And Mearsheimer's response was, it doesn't matter how many times you tell them it's not a threat. If they consider it a threat, it's a threat. 
right? And they will react as though it's a threat if they consider it a threat. So absolutely, they consider the, the stationing of, of U.S. forces in Eastern Europe to be a direct threat to their national security. Same as we consider Russians going into Venezuela as, as, as something that we should be concerned about. Sir, I have one back here. Yes. So you talk about this buffer zone that Russia is striving to maintain. The question is how sustainable is that for Russia, assuming that these are legitimate countries with sovereign nations uh, that perhaps can take either side as, as they wish? Russia, Russia's challenged there by, by Ukraine and of all places now Belarus is starting to challenge uh, uh, Russian perceptions in the, in the East as being a buffer state. Um, but it's also being challenged in some of the Central Asian states by China, okay, by China, as, so, as China is investing heavily into those Central Asian states. Now, right now, I, I, I talked about the fact that the, it, by concentrating on the, the other areas that Russia was involved, the U.S. couldn't concentrate on Russia. By concentrating on where the U.S. is involved, Russia has a harder time concentrating on China. Okay? So they're working closer with China and not being as antagonistic towards China because of the fact that they have to maintain their, their focus on the U.S. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Join us to present a talk of appreciation to Dr. And, and, and informing us of, of, of your work. Uh, as you know, uh, the professor is, is part of our partnership with Troy University, and we share in these partnerships because, uh, as you can see, as evidence today, it works. Uh, Russia and China are, are, are the key topic of discussion in the new national defense strategy, and we are taking a closer look to it. So lectures like yours are very important for our students who are getting ready to, to graduate and potentially uh, faces threats in the future. So in the name of all the men and women of WinSec, uh, we would like to thank you for coming and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Damas y caballeros, y con esto concluimos la parte matutina del día de hoy.